Curly, coily, kinky. Natural hair comes in all shapes, sizes, curl patterns, and all kinds of beauty. That is, Afro textured hair that is not straightened in any form. And an interesting fact, it's the only type of hair on humans that goes against gravity. For black people, natural hair means culture, tradition, and heritage. It's something of pride that's worth celebrating. That's a lot of goodness packed into this one of a kind type of hair, right? But the truth is, natural hair is also one of the most controversial hair types you'll ever come across. The controversy is so real for us people who wear our natural Afro textured hair that it affects who wants to date us, who wants to hire us for a job, who wants to let us into their social circle. To make matters worse, we also get it from our loved ones. Harmful comments, attitude, and other behaviors from our family members that further hurt our self-esteem, confidence, and sense of self. Clearly, natural hair goes beyond curls and kinks. It doesn't take me as long to do my hair in the morning these days. I often put it in a bun and put some products in it and go. Coming from Nigeria, I didn't grow up thinking that it was a problem. Where I came from, hair is celebrated. And moving here, it was very different. And being able to go back to wearing my hair like this, it took me back. It just really made me fall in love with my culture all over again, that I can be who I am without having to, to change. I grew up in Nigeria, in Benin City, Edo State. And what I loved about growing up back home was how confident people that I had in my life were. And especially the women, just being very strong women. Hair was important. Hair was a significant thing because it told us who is who in the community, um, where people come from, who their families are. The way that we do our hair for different occasions meant something. We moved to Canada when I was around 13, and my first point of entry into Canada was Halifax, Nova Scotia. It was a culture shock in terms of different things like food, the way people look, the way people talk. And I think what was hard for me at the time was just finding where I fit in. I was seeing more people with um, relaxed hair than I normally did when I was growing up back home. I remember I would buy those YM magazines and I would just be flipping through it. And it was really, hard to not see yourself in those magazines. No complexion looks like you, nothing looks like you. All you see is straight hair, all that European style of what body image is and should be. My first year in Halifax was very traumatic <laughs> because um, here I was in a new country living with three men, my brothers and my dad. And my dad, bless his heart, um, Dealing with a teenage girl just didn't know what to do. So it was better to send me to auntie's houses to get my hair braided or to send me to a salon to get my hair relaxed and permed. I bought into the myth that it's easier to manage and also to be new in this culture where people have relaxed hair. You kind of want to fit in, right? And that was why I got into relaxing my hair and just doing different things to hide my textured hair. All of that was my experience growing up. For the past couple of years, I've been organizing the Edmonton Natural Hair Show in Alberta and the Maritimes Natural Hair and Beauty Show in Nova Scotia, a space where the community can come together and celebrate textured hair. Over the years, I've learned that other women had the same experience when they were also growing up. And the saddest part is that 
it's the same story for other women today and kids too. Whether we believe it or not, we are expressing our history. There are some who will say, listen, I'm not putting anything in my hair. And when I say anything, not even moisturizers. And there's another set that says, no, I have to upkeep myself because I remember the story of 400 years without a comb and my, my slave master and that look, I don't want to look like that. What does slavery have to do with anything? Slavery might have ended a long time ago, and you would think all of that is behind us, but that's far from the truth. I wanted to talk to someone who sees all kinds of people coming through her door to get their hair done. I remember my first perm was just for me super. It was like this white, creamy mixture. When it went on, it had to be like combed and smoothed out, but it could not be combed too much or else your hair would come out. So when you first put it on, you have to smooth it out and then just leave it. In memory, I can feel that stinging. And then there's also that overwhelming chemical smell. In the first couple of times, I can smell you like, oh, I'm, my, I'm gonna have a fresh hairdo. And then after a while, it like kind of starts, for me, it started to feel like dread. I literally had pieces of my scalp like burnt and clumping off with hair stuck in it. And it was like bleeding and scabby. And I was like, okay, maybe we're not gonna do this anymore because it, does, it doesn't work. And, and at that point, I was getting perms in the professional salon. Why do you think we put ourselves through that kind of a process to have our hair to be straight? I think as a woman, there's an expectation that you have to go through a certain amount of pain in order to maintain what would be considered your beauty. And I think that there's an idea that if you don't give in your discomfort, that you're not gonna get the outcome that you wanna get. The entire beauty industry looks at black hair as a starting point and not as the finishing point. I think that it's like a gradient that starts maybe with blonde hair and blue eyes. There are people who have dark brown hair and brown eyes who wear blue contacts and dye their hair blonde. It just happens to be that with darker skin and coiled hair, we're a lot further away. So what winds up happening is the things that we have to do to jump across that, that gradient to get there are a lot more detrimental. And we see it in terms of skin lightening. We see it in wearing straighter hair as well. I don't want to attribute wearing wigs and weaves and straight hair solely to wanting to achieve uh, Europeanized beauty standards because we like to have fun and do different things and there's a lot of people who like to do that. I think it's important that you're allowed to wear your hair however you want to. You just don't feel like you have to in order to succeed and that you don't feel like you have to in order to be accepted. I think historically, the care of black hair is something that was passed down from mother to daughter, particularly in, in many tribes. Unfortunately, because of the transatlantic slave trade, there's a lot of interrupted history. There were families split apart, there's traditions split apart, and then also the mixing of that, because people in one space or one plantation weren't from the same places. You would just take the laborers that you need from different tribes and put them together, and a lot of that traditions were lost. If I'm thinking about how it is on the plantation, like if you have straighter hair, you kind of get to go inside versus being outside. There is, from that time, a point where you can see you, you get the better job with this hair. Remembering that we come from a tradition of hairstyles reflecting your social standing. We come from a, that tradition before colonialism was introduced. So we just took that colonialism and layered it over this tradition that we already had. And because the guy who's doing the best in all of this has straight hair, the lady who kind of has the power, she has straight hair. It makes sense that we would want to emulate those hairstyles of the person who is in charge of stuff. No doubt that historical events like slavery really affected the way the world thinks about a Black person's body, from hair to toe, and in turn, how we Black folk feel about ourselves. If you do the math, it might shock you to learn that Black people haven't been out of the physical and visible bondage of slavery for that long. 
Slavery ended about 130 years ago. Jim Crow laws ended about 50 years ago. And apartheid about 20 years ago. But that's just how long Black people have had to start thinking about ourselves differently after more than 550 years of being told and treated otherwise. I wanted to speak to someone who could weigh in on how Black people's hair journey has evolved over time. And that's where Judy comes in. I think back in the 70s and 80s, there was a stronger pride in Black beauty out of desperation, because things were really bad politically. Still on television and the magazines and stuff, it was, you know, all white people you were seeing. And then the Black Power Movement showed up and like we were out there with the fists and the whole works, you know. We were engaged and we were part of the society. For me, here was very, is very political. I wish it didn't have to be, because to me it's, just an appendage like your fingers or your hand or anything. But in the political climate that we have, we are living in, we are forced to use it as a political weapon. It should be just hair. What was your experience like when you first moved here compared to like how natural hair was back home in Grenada and what you saw it as when you first moved to Fort Mac? I think back then when we when I moved to Fort Mac as as, as well as Edmonton, I never felt the, the intention was to dehumanize. I thought that it was more about curiosity, but I hated people touching my hair because there were not a lot of black people coming to live in Fort McMurray at the time. How was it finding products or salons or stylists or just generally taking care of your hair? Yeah. Actually, I was going through some of these and there's a haircut. How old would you say you were in that photograph? That was probably 1980. That was an ebony in every haircut. It's a yeah. really yeah. unique style. Yeah. And then there was another afro. Oh, this is nice too. Yeah. Oh, so. I like the smile in this. It seems today, uh, more of our people are buying into the fake hair and all those other stuff compared to, say, maybe the 70s and the 80s where people were more talking about the pride in being black. I think um, wearing hair other than your own has negative impact on who we are as black women because we're no longer appreciative of who we are as individuals or as a people. And we see others as being more important. And this ties in with colonialism and imperialism in the sense that we were made to feel, and I'm gonna cry, we were made to feel that we were not good enough. Everything was wrong and it persists today. And it's sad that our people have bought into that paradigm. It is so, so sad to witness. That is disheartening. Very disheartening. Natural hair affects people beyond the strands that are on our heads. For hundreds of years, Black people have been consciously and unconsciously subscribing to harmful narratives that have severely damaged our self-esteem, confidence, identity, and culture. I wanted to find out why we continue the negative narrative. For me, that means going back to where it all started. We are here in Halifax because in a way, my passion for natural hair started from here when I was young. Learning about a different culture, learning about what textured hair means here. I remember growing up and what I was seeing around me in the city, from my school system to my social circles to just out in the community. It's like, oh no, your hair is a problem. <laughs> It determines a lot of things that affect you in life, like your romantic relationships and your employability. Um, all those thought processes started growing in my head. And how can you talk about black hair in Canada without covering Viola Desmond? Most people probably know her as the lady on our $10 bill and the person who fought racial segregation at a movie theater in New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. Some people probably don't also know that 
She was actually a trailblazer in the black hair and beauty industry in Canada. At the time, she saw that there were no products or courses available in the province to learn the skills she needed to care for black hair. She decided to go to Montreal and New York to get the training. She had a salon and a school and taught what she learned to the community. She knew that representation mattered and actually did something about it, especially in a difficult era. I have to commend her for that. The natural hair community is an extension of what Violet Desmond did decades ago. The natural hair community is building and sharing resources where none were available before. Everyday people and hair professionals are learning skills that they are passing on to others about this unique hair that was disregarded for so long by product companies, salons, and society. It's Friday, January 10th. Good morning. While I'm in Halifax, I wanted to take the chance to talk to someone who's a big supporter of both hair shows, Portia Clark. Viola Desmond was a trailblazer for what she contributed to the black hair community. Portia Clark is a modern day trendsetter for wearing her hair natural on TV. I grew up in a white household. I'm adopted, so I was the only black person in my family. So I was the only person who had black hair, obviously. So uh, my mom found it a bit challenging, I think, to do my hair and to know how to do my hair because everybody else had straight blonde hair. And I think I just, in general, didn't like my appearance that much either because I didn't look like anybody uh, in my family or in my community because I grew up in a small Nova Scotia fishing village where there wasn't any other black people. We would come up to Halifax and she would take me to the salons or she would take me to a friend of hers who had black hair and ask her to give me some advice on my hair. So I really appreciate what she tried to do. It was all part of a bigger picture, I think, though, of me struggling with acceptance of myself. The hair was kind of a symbol of that. But then when I went to TV, that's when I started thinking, so do I need to change it somehow? and maybe straighten my hair again and go to a more traditional, because you know everybody talks about anchor hair. Anchor hair is straight from what I could see, like any news person has, usually has straight hair. So I was struggling with, well, maybe I should go back to having straightened hair because it'll look more, I'll fit in more and seem more like the person that I'm trying to be on TV. We had image consultants who would come in and talk to us about our look on TV and give us tips on improving how we looked. And usually what I got from the image consultants was to make my hair smaller so it was less distracting to the audience and that you could see more of my smile and my eyes, my, my communicators. But yeah, I did struggle a bit with how I should present myself and whether I should, you know, get a weave or wear a wig or whatever. But I just couldn't bring myself to wear a wig because I would just feel like really not me, like not my hair, and I didn't want to go back to straightening it all the time. People have told me afterwards that they thought it was kind of a bold choice for me to have my hair natural on TV because nobody else really did. And I didn't really think of it as a bold choice. I just thought of it as a practical choice and one that would suited me more. Practical. That's one reason some people might say no to wearing their natural textured hair. It's not practical enough. It's not something, something enough. When patients come in and they will start pulling out all these negative things, my hair is tough, my hair is hard, my hair is dry. So why would you say that about yourself? My mother said it, or I'm so used to hearing that. And I say, you have to stop that cycle. It's bigger than just the hair. Intergenerational trauma happens more often than we know. Like Dr. Wong points out, the words that come out of our mouth about our textured hair are more than just words. They come from a deeper place outside of ourselves. They are from our parents and their parents and their parents' parents and continue to be passed down. It's so good to see you. Michelle, a mother of two girls chatted with me about how the language her family used to talk to her affected her and now possibly her girls. 
When I was five, which is the same age as my youngest daughter, my oldest sister relaxed my hair for the first time with adult relaxer, not kid relaxer. <laughs> Not child-friendly relaxer, with regular adult relaxer. And the thing is that at five years old, I did not have the wisdom to own that decision. So all that happened was is now someone else has relaxed my hair because they told me it was too nappy and too unkempt and they couldn't manage it. So they relaxed it and then slowly my hair started to drop out. But the narrative at that time was do anything to cover these kinks, basically. It was this narrative that was ingrained by actions, because actions speak louder than words. And when you tell me that my hair is nappy and it's unkempt and you use words, but then you also back it up with actually trying to change it and saying you are just not good enough in your natural state, that stays with you. And I never wanted to do that to my girls, but I was doing that to my oldest daughter with my verbiage because that's what I was taught. Those things are passed down. We are told that it's not gonna be professional. It's not gonna be accepted in the workplace. Sometimes we're told that from our families. I know my own mother has told me, uh, you're not really going to go to an interview like that. And I'm like, like what? This is just the hair on my head. She goes, go put a wig on that. We've had those messages delivered to us and we receive those and it tells us we're just not enough. And so because a lot of individuals are not choosing to own that aspect of themselves, their natural hair, we've converted to uh, a Eurocentric form of beauty. Before going natural, my language definitely was not in alignment with where it should have been. Um, when I spoke to my children, I would say, oh, your hair looks uh, nappy, or your hair looks messy, or it looks rusty. And she saw it normalized for me that my own hair wasn't sufficient and that when we would go somewhere special, I had to make sure I went to the hairdressers and paid a whole leap of money to go get a whole new hair piece installed because what I had on my hair naturally was not sufficient for this big event. And I had to explain to her, honey, your hair is absolutely beautiful. You don't need to straighten it and put chemicals in it because I knew what struggles I had gone through. And even though I was still not at that place yet for myself, I didn't want her to have to go through that because I spoke the wrong narrative over her. I wanted to teach her the right narrative. That was a big pushing factor as well for me to go natural because I said, I can tell her all her life, but if I walk around here not owning that for myself too, She's never gonna truly um, take that in for herself, so I've gotta also change my narrative for myself. And I have found that um, just by embracing it for myself, I have met little girls and their hair is not natural, but because they can see another individual who looks just like them, you're black as well too, and they say, wow, your hair is pretty and can I touch it? And all of a sudden it normalizes it for them that this is okay. I don't have to be ashamed of my hair on my head, irregardless of what the narratives are in my own home. There is women out there who are embracing it, and there's gonna be a time that that child may make the decision to embrace it for themselves, and it may simply be because they saw enough people around them who were doing it for themselves. Oh. That's exactly what it's all about. The next generation, Ready? and the kind of message they're getting. When I was growing up in Halifax, I only had magazines filled with people who didn't look like me. I didn't have many options. The good news is that the natural hair community is growing online and reaching kids everywhere. Thanks to websites and personal blogs, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Kenya is one of the most popular Canadian natural hair social media influencers on Instagram. She's leading the change in the online world in a positive way. I started my Instagram page about seven years ago. I have 110,000 followers. And my YouTube channel, I have about 27,000 subscribers. It was mainly for the first probably year, just me doing hairstyles, natural hairstyles. And it started to grow from there. I posted a picture of me and my daughters from about when they were like six, and then I put up a more recent picture of how we look now, for throwback Thursday, and the picture went viral. I find social media has a really big impact on the natural hair community. If you're not natural and you go on Instagram and you see all these lovely natural hairstyles, you're gonna be so tempted, motivated, and encouraged to switch over. I wasn't as confident in my natural hair until I started 
seeing all this natural hair stuff going on on Instagram. It's almost like a domino effect, okay? I see you, I ask about your hair, I wanna try it. I go do what you do. I get the hang of it. Someone sees me. Oh, your hair looks nice. What do you use for you? So it keeps going. Like everyone keeps wanting to do the natural thing because they see someone who looks really nice on. They want to at least try it. And you can find these videos in every different hair type. There's a video for everybody on YouTube if you have questions about how do I do this? How do I go natural? Having healthy hair and knowing how to care for my hair means a lot more to me that I'm able to care for the hair that just grows naturally from my head and not have to alter its kinkiness, its curliness. I can just leave it the way it is. For sure, the natural hair community has grown beyond leaps and bounds. But it's not all happy faces on social media because there's still some pushback, even in the black community, about how people should wear their hair. Here's the very first show, the very first meetup. Oh my God. I'm inspired by Stephanie Joseph, the founder of the Textured Hair and Beauty Show in Toronto. I spoke to Stephanie to find out her passion for starting the show and how she sees the bashing that's happening in the online community. The reason why I started it was to create a platform for women to come out and learn more about their hair in its natural state. And not only women, men as well because it would have been nice for my father to know how to take care of my hair when I was younger. And not only for black women, but for other cultures to come and get an understanding of what our hair is like and our culture as well. Over the years, the show has changed where I've seen more and more women who come out um, who have a looser texture. And, and now I've changed the name from the Toronto Natural Hair and Beauty Show to the Textured Hair and Beauty Show because my demographics were changing. Um, for example, the Egyptian woman that I met, beautiful head of hair, very curly, and she's like, I don't like my hair. People don't take me serious if my hair is not straight. And I was like, wow, like, there's a whole nother world out there that, of people with natural hair that this show can also benefit. In the natural hair community, <laughs> online, do you feel that there is bashing and negative talks amongst people that have different hair types? Oh yeah, there's always a fight going on. And the first things first, I always say, look, people act like they've never had a relaxer in their life. And those are the people that I can't stand. Let them come into it when they want to come into it. You don't have to go around bashing someone because of how they choose to wear their hair. When I used to wear my hair in an afro, I remember one time I took my son to the barber shop and I walked in and a gentleman said to me, what are you gonna do with that? And I was like, I looked at him, I'm like, that what? And he's like, you're here. What do you mean? What are you gonna do with that? I said, this is the way my hair grows. I'm surprised that you've been asking me this. But again, to some people, the older ones, maybe not all, it's still looked at as, as a bad thing. The natural hair movement is a powerful movement because it's a movement of expression. It also shows a major disconnect with identity. In order for you to take that step to wear natural hair, you also have to condition your mind, change your mindset, and change it to the point that you are connecting with the change. So what did people say about your hair today at school? Did they notice it was different today? Yeah, um, as soon as I walked into the classroom, everyone was just watching me like, what is that? <laughs> Well, I know you don't wear braids very often, but you sometimes... I, I never wear braids. <laughs> I have never walked into my classroom with braids in my hair. It's important to show her different ways of taking care of her hair and empower her to see the versatility of her hair. And so when we have the discussion about why she hates her hair, then we get into, well, is it because you don't like the way you look? And for her, it's more she wants to have flowing flippy, flippable hair. She wants straight hair. Do you like the look of where your hair being big? Yes, but I'd rather my hair straight. Why? Just because. <laughs> I braid it in different ways. I show her that if she leaves the braids in and lets them dry and then takes them out, she can have a different texture. And so hopefully already getting some of those ideas in her head about caring for her own hair, conditioning it and styling it so that she can actually do some different styles and see that it can 
be up, it can be down, it can be straight, and um, she doesn't feel as negatively about it. Thank you, Mommy. You're welcome, yes. You look beautiful. Love it. Love your hair. The struggles that I went through in those early days of my natural hair journey have already happened. I can't change them. What we can do now is focus on the younger people coming up behind us and try to do right by them, by watching our language around them and the way we talk about natural hair, whether that's our own hair, theirs, or someone else's. Love it. It's really nice. Yay! And by simply complimenting them, and telling every little girl that we come across that she's beautiful beyond her curls and kinks. Mm -hmm.